Last Wednesday, our gospel tailed off with Pontius Pilate asking a cynical rhetorical question, what is truth? He was asking the wrong question. The real question is, who is truth? Today we look on as the truth. And whenever I say that word, please consider it with a capital T. We look on as that truth hangs on the cross, bearing the sins of the whole world in order to reconcile us to the Father. Truth was incarnate in Jesus Christ and he willingly walked that path for you and for me. Our sermon series throughout this Lenten season has centered on God's call through Joel to return to him, to admit our sinful nature and to come to the one who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The one who loves you, who provides for you, and who sent his son to die for you because he relents over disaster. His call today is for his people to return to the truth, to turn to Jesus Christ. He alone is our life. He alone is our salvation. The chief priests and the scribes and the whole council had turned Jesus over to Pontius Pilate. They insisted that he had done evil, that he deserved nothing less than death. Pilate knew that they were driven by selfish motivations but he was backed into a corner. His was an impossible choice. To put an innocent man to death or lose control of the town that will very likely erupt into a riot and therefore probably lose his job too, perhaps more. As chaotic as it seemed, everything was going according to plan, but not the plan of the scribes, not the plan of the Pharisees, Not the plan of Pilate. This is the plan that God himself has put together from the very beginning of time, a plan of salvation needed because of mankind's fall into sin. A plan that included a battle, a battle between the offspring of a serpent serpent, and the offspring of a woman, as God promises in Genesis chapter 3. A plan that required that the heel of the Son of Man be bruised, but would finally be complete as the head of the serpent was crushed and death was stripped of its power. The plan that would play out on a cross with Jesus Christ at the center. So Pilate, he tries to placate the accusers. He has Jesus flogged and tortured, mocked, and insulted, whipped and beaten nearly to death. Dressed in a purple robe in a sarcastic and mocking acknowledgement of his divinity. The plan is in motion. Jesus has to die. Crucify him, crucify him. John tells us it was the chief priests and the officers who cried these words. But adding to their voices are you and I. Our sinful nature rises up in protest as Christ demands our attention. The law defines our attention, our our actions. It seeks to control us, and we want no part of that. You shall have no other gods. Fine, I'll have only one God, and it will be me. This man, this son of God, wants first place? No, no, he must die. Crucify him. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. This man has blasphemed and called himself the son of God. Crucify him. Honor the Sabbath day by keeping it holy can't tell me what to do. Crucify him. Honor your father and mother. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal or bear false witness. You shall not covet. Crucify him. 
Our sinful nature drives us to be disgusted by God's leading. Our sinful nature wants nothing to do with it because as Paul tells us in Romans chapter eight, it is hostile to God for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Our sinful nature rises up before the truth and closes its ears and shouts, crucify him. But the truth cannot be silenced. The truth echoes in our ears, even as we appear, as we see him appear and hang lifeless on the cross of Calvary. The truth gets past all of our defenses and the word softens our hearts. We may cry out in anger, crucify him! But the truth, that is the man, our savior, Jesus Christ, he responds by whispering gently in our ears, yes, Yes, crucify me. That's the only way out of this mess you're in. Someone has to die for what you've done, and I have come for that purpose. Crucify me. Look at the cross. Look at the one who hangs on it, bearing our sins, taking our punishment. Isaiah tells us his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Look at this man. Look at your Savior, beaten and bloody and suffering. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. He dies for you. He carries your griefs, your sorrows, your sin, your guilt. Why? Why does it have to be like this? God tells us again through the prophet Isaiah, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. He poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Your Savior, your Lord, who died for your sins, who made intercession for you, who willingly poured himself out to death so that you would have life. John quotes Jesus when he says, He is the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. And so, in this glorious transformation, our hearts, now softened and led by the Holy Spirit, finally relent and cry out, Yes, crucify him, but not in anger. No, now, because we see there is no other way. Isaiah tells us that all of our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. And we can't fix it. We can't be good enough. We can't be without sin. We can't win our own salvation. Whatever good we might do is completely overshadowed by our own sinful nature. Matthew tells us, with man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. With God. With God. And with God alone, we can be saved. But someone must endure the penalty. God's wrath must be satisfied. The wages of sin is death. Someone has to die. And here is Jesus. He is that someone. He must die. He lived the perfect life where we could not. He has taken all of our sins on himself. He took all of it to the cross to satisfy God's wrath. And he gives us his own righteousness in return. 
in that great exchange, asking only that we trust him and leave the work to him. So today, as we survey the cross on which the Prince of Glory died, may we hear God's call to return to him, to return to truth, to trust in the one who has promised us salvation and eternal life. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did ever such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? In the name of our suffering servant, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.